So welcome everybody to our uh, online personal development session on young learner classroom management. Uh, we're going to be looking at some of the problems that you probably are already facing with younger learners in the classroom. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what causes those problems and then we'll have a think about eight effective treatments. Uh, for the first part, I'm going to get some ideas from you as to um, what happens in the classroom and also uh, what might be behind those uh, problems. Then I'll be talking for a little bit about the different um, actions that you can take as a teacher. After I finish talking, I'll be sending you to breakout rooms with a little activity so that you can talk about these eight different methods. So, Here we go. Where's the next one? Classroom management. You've most of you, I should imagine by now, have had some experience in the classroom. You're at your schools and you're teaching. You've got young learners or slightly less young learners. I mean, here with the young learners, we're going up to about the age of 18, technically speaking. So there could be classroom management issues there. But I think the focus of a lot of what we're doing in this session will be more to do with the younger, younger learners. So um, those going up to maybe 12, 13 years of age. Um, what problems have you experienced in the young learner classroom, first of all? And then we're going to think about what causes these problems. So uh, if anyone would like to speak and share something that's happened recently, uh, please use the um, reaction button in Zoom to put your hand up and I will call upon you to contribute. Whilst people are thinking what they might want to say, I can give you an example from a recent lesson. Um, at my school, we have um, a signal group so that people can send out messages saying, please help when situations occur. And a message that came out a couple of days ago at the school was, please help. One of my young learners is sitting under the desk and refuses to come out. So we can talk about how to fix that problem later, but that's an example of the sort of classroom uh, management problem that you might have experienced. Shireen. Uh, so the other day um, at my school, we had a schedule, and so one of the things that we scheduled was story time in English. And so I got everyone to come sit down for story time. And so I start reading the story, and two of the kids like go off in a corner and start playing. I'm like, come on, listen to the story. Like, I know that they they may not be interested in it, but it's part of the schedule. We're supposed to be reading a story, and so I'm trying to figure out what is happening. And these, the they're like preschoolers, so they're like one of them is four and one of them is six. So I eventually I just like, okay, I can't figure out what they're doing. They can't speak to me in English. I get another student to ask them in Polish. And she says, oh, he says the story is stupid. And I'm just like, what? what do I even say to that? <laughs> like, I get it, but also, <laughs> how do I like, even begin to deal with that? Yeah, that, that is a very tricky uh, situation. Hopefully one of the eight techniques we'll be discussing today might be able to remedy that to an extent. But thank you for sharing, Shirin. Uh, Gabby. So on uh, one of my last lessons, one of uh, uh, recent lessons, uh, I had uh, many fun activities prepared, but uh, the children were so, uh, well, they wouldn't listen to me. They didn't react to any, um, they didn't react to me uh, asking them to sit down or to do anything. And they didn't um, care about the consequences of their bad behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so warnings didn't work. Me asking them to be quiet or to behave well didn't work. Like mm -hmm. anything. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a common problem. Um, Corinne has a similar one that she sent in the chat that she has a class of 12 students that won't keep quiet at all. They're aged about seven or eight. Uh, yeah, I can certainly uh, sympathize. I certainly recognize that, that issue 
from my own classrooms sometimes. Um, there are things that we can do, or at least things that we can attempt to do, whether or not they'll be successful is quite, quite different. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, is it, yeah. yeah. Um, so I had a class the other day. Um, I share it with a Polish teacher. So the Polish teacher takes the first half an hour. I take the second half an hour. But unfortunately, the Polish teacher gave all these kids, there were 12 of them in the class, they, she gave them all balloons. So while I'm trying to teach with flashcards, uh, these kids are blowing up balloons and letting the balloons off all over the class and they're hitting each other with balloons. And it's, yeah, it was an absolute nightmare just to try and even take the balloons away from these kids. They like, Oh, you can't. Four years no. old. No, that wouldn't work, and would it? Now they're crying because you're taking yeah. the balloons away. It was a nightmare. Yeah. That's a very specific situation. Um, and I'm not sure if the techniques we'll be looking at will directly deal with that. So maybe I could suggest something now if ever that happens to anybody. Um, unfortunately, it looks like a situation has emerged that you have no control over, but that happens. Sometimes students will arrive after their birthday or something and they'll have things, maybe sweets for the class. Uh, there are ways of integrating these disruptions into our class. So I'll speak very briefly about that now. Uh, in that situation, one thing you could do would be to kind of distribute the flashcards around a small area in the classroom and have the students line up with the balloon in their mouth, let them inflate it a bit and let it go. And then it goes like that. And whatever flashcard it lands on, they then have to say the word, something like that. So that you kind of, you, you take the situation, you take the cards you're dealt essentially, and you try and do something with it. But it is a very difficult situation to be put in. And maybe it would be a time to actually talk to, uh, to your, your pair teacher and say, give me a heads up next time or maybe just don't do that um i'm just glad that it wasn't a whole load of chocolate or something because <laughs> that would have um its own consequences to go along with it okay wonderful um so we've got some examples of the sort of classroom in uh issues that we uh we might have to face and i think that everything else that we face will be a variation on a theme connected to those majority of these problems are to do with disruption lack of focus and things like that but where do these problems come from does anyone have any theories why are some students sometimes disruptive why do some students not want to pay attention if you've got an idea hand up in zoom and let's hear it gabby well i suppose it depends on the age and of the growing process sometimes, mm -hmm. because uh, when children are growing, then they've got a lot of things going in their minds. Yeah. So that might be one reason. And uh, nowadays, uh, young kids are <clears throat> uh, sometimes forced to learn English. Yeah. So that might be another reason. Yes. Yeah, that's definitely on the list. Um, one thing that's not really on the list, but it should be, I suppose, is the idea of the different stages of socialization that your students will have reached. And here with younger learners, it could even come down to a difference between whether the child is an only child and therefore has all of their parent, uh, parents' attention, or if they come from a household with siblings where they have to learn interaction protocols with those siblings. And I do see that myself with some of my younger students. I can see when a student is more self-centered or egotistical or less likely to share either materials or tasks with their partners. At lower ages, I can often guess that they would be from single child households and they haven't yet learned or adopted the sort of um, approaches that you would expect as part of socialization. Well, thank you very much for your contribution there, Gabby. So um, looking then at um, some of these ideas, um, Corin's uh, got the idea of lack of discipline, but yeah, that causes problems. But where does it actually come from? I would say that these are the majority. Most problems come from one of these. 
So lack of motivation, that ties in with what Gabby has just said. Uh, the students don't know why they are there. They might also have come to you after their regular schooling. If you're in a private language school context, they've already had school and now they've been taken out for more school and they might not see the point there or they might just resent uh, the um, imposition. Sometimes, though, classroom management issues occur because the students themselves have insufficient language for the task that you want them to do. So this comes into the whole planning stage that uh, when you plan a task, you might not have thought completely through every stage of in terms of uh, the language that they need to do it. If it's something simple like pointing at a flashcard and saying the word, that's fine. But some students will find it difficult to put that into a sentence and that can cause them problems. They want to communicate something, but they don't have the language. Shirin? I think you're muted. Uh, there we, there are. we go. Um, yeah, I, with the insufficient language, what do you do when you have, like, I have two kids who are completely, like, Fluent, like one came from New Zealand and the other went to English and French preschool in France for a few years and speaks like a native speaker. And then I have another student who is knows like colors and numbers and stuff. So how do I how do you balance that? Or is that gonna be so that's better? in the same class then? Yeah, yeah. That's that's, that's a, my class. Yeah. It's a really difficult situation. Um, it's, not, it's not ideal and mm. we try to avoid that sort of situation wherever possible, but if it's the situation you have to deal with, then you have to deal with it. Uh, there is no easy solution to that because what you're basically trying to do is to teach language to some, but for others, they're in a position of being able to still acquire language and the two processes are very different. Um, I've had that situation myself quite often. So what I do is I essentially make the uh, the more native speakery sort of students into assistant teachers. So I give them instructions for the task and their job is to then go to the students and tell the students what to do or to repeat the instructions or to monitor things. Um, but it can be very difficult because uh, that can lead to issues. A student who has a very high level of English for the, for the class will get through the task in a much shorter period than uh, the other students. And then you have to find something for them to do. So, yeah, there are a lot of issues there and um, the, the solutions are not straightforward. Yeah, part of my issue is I have more native speakers than I do kids who don't know anything. Mm -hmm. I only have three kids in my class. Uh -huh. So it's like, I, one of the things that I do do is I try to give the ones who have more English, like, more complicated words if we're learning, like, the basic vocabulary lessons. One like uh, the one who doesn't know very much English will like learn under, and the others will learn underneath. Yeah. yeah. Another approach that you could another approach you could adopt within that particular classroom would be to use the uh, the station teaching approach. I don't know if anyone has come across that idea. It's where instead of teaching the whole class all the time, you set up stations in the room. I mean, it can work with small classes as well as large. So maybe that's the project station. That's the independent reading station. And this is the teacher station where it's kind of one on one with flashcards and drilling. So you would set up the stations so that instead of teaching, for example, the three students, you might be teaching an individual student and a two to one. So you send the two to one off to the reading station for 10 minutes and you do some flashcard work with the first student, then they could do a small project, for example, drawing their own versions of the flashcards. Or if, uh, for example, I, I was doing um, the things that you find in a fun fair with my students the other day. So they did a design your own fun fair project. So they were drawing and then labeling their project. But you could set up the stations and that way, you'll be giving individual attention to the students who need different things at different times. So that would be something to maybe experiment with. Cool. That, that, yeah, I mean, thank you. Yeah. As well as not having the language to accomplish the task, a lot of students get frustrated when the task instructions are overcomplicated or there are too many things delivered at once. 
if you're giving students three instructions to follow and they need to remember them in order and go through each, they might not have the language to process those instructions in the first place. They might not be able to recall the second instruction after the first, and they might not have enough language to judge when they have finished a particular part of the task. So having overcomplicated tasks where you give too much to them um, is a bit of a problem, but so too is the teacher talk of instructions. Um, there are essentially two things that you're teaching in the classroom. You're teaching the target language and you're teaching the language of delivery. So the target language might be colors, but the language of delivery might be open your book, find page six. Now that's not the target language, but it is the language that the students need to learn through the lessons. And as we'll discuss later, having a very restricted uh, set of language for those sort of instructions can help smooth the way with task instructions. Sometimes the students don't know what is expected of them. That could be to do with the um, task instructions, but it could just be that they don't understand the nature of the task. So to give you one example recently, um, I've got a group of 11 year olds and they're, they're fairly strong. Uh, we're now doing a B1 course and the course book introduces tasks from the Cambridge preliminary exam. And one of those tasks is that you've got, for example, I think it's five um, people talking about something. So here it was talking about their hobbies. And then you've got eight descriptions of people according to the things that they like to do. You had to match those five to the eight. Now, this was the first time that the students had encountered this task and they didn't understand that three of the options would be unused. So they were trying to match all eight to the five and they weren't able to really do it and that was partly my fault because I hadn't clearly, I hadn't made it obvious enough to them what they had to do in this task. So it wasn't about the instructions here, but rather what I expected from the students. And we have the same sort of things with um, speaking activities where you model it yourself and the students, instead of taking that as a model, try to replicate it using exactly the same words that you'd used even if they're not appropriate to them. So you say, my favorite food is pizza, my favorite drink is coffee. Now you tell your partner, but they just say, my favorite food is pizza, my favorite drink is coffee. And you're like, you're too young for coffee, what are you doing? They didn't see the aim of the uh, task. So despite the instructions themselves appearing very clear, the students weren't sure what they needed to do and then they start turning to their partner and asking in Polish, what are we supposed to do here? The other person suddenly becomes unsure of themselves. I don't know. Uh, let's just talk to each other and let's just do it in Polish and then let's start to misbehave. And it starts to go that way. Task fatigue definitely comes into it a lot. Um, task fatigue would be when you've spent too long doing something um, and the students can no longer focus on it. Um, as adults, we are able to focus on a particular task until we have completed the task. Um, young learners don't have that self-control yet. They often have excess energy. I'm tired all the time, but I'm in my 40s. Four-year-olds are never really tired unless they're tired of not doing things. And it's remarkable. I saw this with my own children when we were on, on holiday in Warsaw. We walked for, for hours and they were complaining, my legs hurt, I'm tired, I want to stop. And then we saw a playground and they ran to it. And they were zooming around the playground on the swings, on the climbing frame. And I thought, what on earth is this? And it was partly task fatigue from walking too much, but it was also that the walking didn't satisfy their need for kind of up and atom activities they needed that bit of motion and then the final one would be disorientation and this is when maybe there's just too much language around the students and they they are trying to take it all in but not in a natural kind of acquisition approach but rather fixating on everything they hear and it just becomes too much it's like sensory overload 
And when students start to feel sensory overload, they might respond by withdrawing, sitting under a table, for example. They need a bit of quiet. Okay, so those are some of the main reasons then that classroom management issues emerge. And what we're going to do now is go through eight different approaches that we can use. Then I'll send you off to breakout rooms to actually discuss the eight to see what you can remember about them and how likely they are to work in your context. So the first one, I would say, has to do with making your materials as appealing as possible. Now, this does require a bit of extra work, unfortunately. Bright colours do attract attention. If you hold up a flashcard that's just a black and white drawing, it might not grab the attention of these students. Their attention is maybe distracted by something out of the window or maybe the balloon the previous teacher gave them. But bright colours do attract attention. High quality visuals, so something that looks like it was made with care, something that's laminated, ideally, suggests that the activity you're doing also has value, It kind of works at a subconscious level. When, uh, when I've done activities in the past where I hand out slips of paper to my students, they start rolling the paper up, they start folding it, the corners are all bent, they might start scribbling on it, and that distracts them from the activity. So having a higher quality, maybe a photograph instead of your own drawing of something, could kind of give to the students this sense that the activity itself is worth doing. For younger students, puppets can help focus attention. None of the students that you teach really want to spend time looking at you. You're not that interesting to them. But if you get, um, oh, it says we're going to end the session in 10 minutes. OK, uh, at the end of this 10 minutes, we're going to be kicked out of Zoom, <laughs> just to let you know. Uh, so I'll have to ask you all to rejoin. OK, <laughs> sorry about that. Anyway, going back to this, then, if you have puppets in the classroom or if you have things that you can take to use as puppets, even if they're just stuffed toys, um, they will help focus the attention because the students are much more interested in it. So if you're reading a story to young students and they don't care much for the story, they might care more for the story if you're doing a silly voice and the puppet is doing the talking rather than you. So that might help. Now, this sort of material creation does cost time, but in a sense, the cost can be banked. You build up a pool of resources that you can use again and again. And let's be honest, with younger learners, it's all about repetition anyway. So when you've got a set of flashcards, for instance, you're not going to use them once. You're going to use them many, many times. First, to introduce the vocabulary, then in another lesson to revise the vocabulary, then in a later lesson to revise it again because they've still forgotten. And you don't want to have to remake that uh, material every time. Having a good high quality bank will help in the long run. After that, though, I like going for student created materials as well, because this gives ownership of the task to the student. The students will feel that there's something of value going on and they will want to be involved and invested because they are making something that you use. So with slightly higher level students, when you're doing a reading text and there's a new word, get them to make a flashcard with that word on one side and uh, a description or definition or the example sentence on the other and keep it in a little hat that you use as a vocabulary box. Then in each subsequent lesson, you can revise that language using their materials. And when they see their handwriting, they will feel a little bit of pride, perhaps, but certainly recognition. They'll be like, aha, I know this. And because they know it, it makes the task that you're doing a bit more achievable. So this does allow for greater personalization as well. So if I've got a flashcard and it's, for example, um, a T-shirt, the flashcard might show a blue T-shirt. So then I can ask my students to draw a T-shirt on a piece of paper, but color it differently. 
And then when you do a little revision activity, you can also revise colors because each student will probably have a different T-shirt to the others. And they can talk about those differences. But because they've come up with them instead of you, then it does allow for a bit more personalization and investment in the task. And then you can take one idea and multiply it across the classroom through that personalization. Um, one of the things that I like to do within this student created materials thing is to do a kind of color dictation. So a lot of workbooks that come with course books are black and white. So once we've done the task, I get the students in pairs. I model the task. I say, look at picture one, look at the boy, look at the T-shirt. The T-shirt is blue. Color the T-shirt blue. So then they color it. Maybe another model if they're lower level. But once I've established it, I can say, OK, work together, teacher, student. So then they go to maybe picture three. Look at the car. The car is red. Color the car red. And then the other student will color their car red. And then they alternate. Uh, this is a nice way of uh, allowing slower students to catch up to reach the end of a particular task and to give the uh, fast completers uh, a chance to um, actually um, do something useful once they've finished the main task. Uh, we talked about this idea a lot uh, in Krakow, the idea of moving step by step. But as a reminder, every activity should take one step further. And you need to plan how you move from activity to activity. It should be clear that one part has finished and you're now moving to the next. If you're taking more than one step, if you're changing more than one variable, you might lose students along the way. And students who are lost or disorientated will tend to become more um, difficult to manage. I recommend that you rehearse instructions for clarity. So when you're planning the task, don't just assume that you know how to address the task to the students, but practice, rehearse, record yourself on your phone, see how long it actually takes you to give instructions for a task and count the number of sentences. Have a look at the grammar of those sentences. Are you using ifs? If you use ifs, you'll lose students. If you use imperatives with simple action verbs that they know, then they will get it and they will find the task more achievable. And always consider how different the next activity is to the preceding one. We need a bit of variation. We want to go from one step to the next, but task fatigue can set in very quickly if more than one task in a row looks like the previous one. So if the first task is workbook exercise one and the next task is workbook exercise two, sure, exercise two is the next step along, but it's the same kind of activity and the students will start to suffer from more fatigue and become disruptive. And connected to that, we have this whole idea, which I'm sure you're very familiar of, of ups and downs in a classroom, movers and settlers. So you want to alternate between movement types. This will help burn off excess energy. But it is also a way to remind the students in a very subtle way that with the settle activities, they need to work as well. So, for example, let's say that I want to do a vocabulary exercise. The first exercise, I might sit the students around in a circle and I would drill the content of the flashcards. Then, because that was a settler, I want to move them. So then I might place the flashcards around the room, say the word, the students have to go to that flashcard. Then I can bring them back down again, place the flashcards on the floor, do a quick review, then turn them over and play a little memory game. What was this one? They can't see the flashcard, they have to remember. So that was another settler. Then I could play a board race where I put the card up on the board and in teams they run to say what the word is. You know, there are lots of things that you can do to go from one activity to the next. But along the way, 
you will be getting them to first move and then settle or settle then move. And this gives them some variation in the way that you're doing the tasks. And it also helps them burn off that excess energy that would be building up in them if they're simply sitting and waiting. So we often worry that our lessons are not different enough, that they're not English enough. But actually, I think that one way to help students make tasks more realizable or attainable is to focus in a little bit on the Polish cultural side. So if you can get to know some Polish traditions and celebrations and bring those into your classes, then you will help the students along. It won't feel like such an alien environment all of a sudden. They will feel more connected to what's what's happening in the classroom. So to give you one example, my daughter, uh, my younger daughter, doesn't really like going to preschool. She's been going for years, but every day is still a struggle unless there is some sort of celebration for that day. So she really wanted to go and she stayed extra hours last week because it was girls day. She loved it. There was a whole celebration about girls. The previous week, she was also excited because it was potato day. I don't know why it was potato day. There didn't seem much to do with potatoes that day, but it was potato day and it was exciting for her. So if you can find out maybe from a Polish colleague when some of these sort of typically Polish celebrations occur, you could mark them on your teaching calendar and try to bring them into the class a little bit. And that way, the students who already know these things from outside of your classroom, they can bring it in and it helps guard against a bit of disorientation. Also learning some of the typical Polish fairy tales and the parables that are used to teach children in this country can also help you to make things more familiar so that the students are reassured. If the story and the language are very different for them, they won't be able to get both, so they might not get either and that can lead to problems. But if the story is familiar and it's only the language of communication that's different, they might be able to kind of get into things a little bit more. So the next thing, and I think you might already have this a little bit, would be to introduce more classroom routines. Younger learners really appreciate structure. We all appreciate structure in our lives. If I miss my morning coffee for one reason or another, the whole day seems to be just complete waste. Might as well just go back to bed and start again the following day. So we find routines to be very reassuring. So you could look at your lesson plans, the ones that you've written before, the ones that you're going to write, and start to mark out the different routine areas. You'll probably have a start to every lesson. That's usually how things go. So I always start with, or the, I, I go through a couple of different routines over the course of the school year, but for the first month, it's key for the socialization process to take effect in my classes. And I know from experience that my students are very bad at learning each other's names. So for my higher level young learners, the start of the lesson is always with what I call a test. And even after several lessons, when I say, oh, it's time for a test, they still get worried and they're like, oh, test, oh, say yes. And then I choose somebody and I say, good, stand up, tell me their names. Every lesson starts that way. So when the students come in, if they've forgotten anyone's name, hopefully they will take a moment to ask each other, oh, what's your name again? I can't remember. So that's the routine I use with my higher level students. With my younger, lower level students, I have a hello and welcome routine. So they go around the room with a bit of formulaic language. Hello, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? Something like that. Uh, some, some teachers like to do it as a song. Some like it as a chant. I've never been particularly taken with songs and chants myself. But if it works for you and if it works for your students, then you should do it. We also have a pre-finish. So that would be the tidying up part. Some people play the uh, let's clean up, let's clean up sort of song, or they can do it as a chant. Um, but having this helps the students become aware that the lesson is drawing to an end. And then you can go into that final part where when the room is completely tidy, I have them line up by the door. I have flashcards ready. 
I open the door, but for them to go past, they have to tell me what's on the first flashcard, second flashcard, so forth. So by having those routines, they know that the lesson has started and they know that the lesson is coming to an end. But with typical activities, and by that I mean activities that repeat during the lesson or between lessons, I also have a lead in that marks what we're doing. So, um, I mean, this can be as simple as doing this to show that they have to stand up, pointing to an open area in the classroom and going like this to show that they need to sit in a semicircle. Then they can see that I'm holding flashcards and they know that we're going to do flashcard drilling. They know then that flashcard drilling is, first of all, they listen as I give them the language, then they repeat as a chorus, and then they're going to repeat individually. So they know this and they don't need to worry too much about what's expected of them. They know from experience what is expected and it's always the same. Now to us, that might seem boring, we love novelty. Children love novelty, but above all, they love reassurance. They need to be reassured that they can do what is expected of them. The same can happen with story time. When you hold up the book and say, what time is it? And they say, it's story time. Who do we listen to? We listen to the teacher, something like this. If you trill this language so that they know what to do at each stage and how to approach each stage. It gives them reassurance and it can help to get around some of the classroom management issues we've spoken about before. Next is to learn their L1. So for most of us, that would be Polish. So why do we need to learn a little bit of Polish? Well, sometimes, one word in Polish is worth 10 minutes of trouble in English, it really is. Sometimes a student knows the word, but they just can't get it out. You can do tip of the tongue techniques like, oh, is it sn? Is it sn? And then they can say snake. But if they can't remember what something is or they, they want to know what the English goes to in the Polish, they're like, oh, I, you can see that they know that word. And you could just point at it and say, oh, yeah, is it vonge? They go, ah, yes. And sometimes this can backfire a little bit. Some of my students now want to use more Polish, but then I can dangle it as a carrot for them. I will say something to them in Polish or I will let them teach me a few words in Polish if we do the work in English first. And some of my students really love it. They, they will go through their work quite happily because I've told them when we finish, you're going to teach me. And they quite like it because, first of all, it shows a little bit of kind of uh, empathy with their situation. It's difficult learning another language. And if you show how it's difficult for you too, they will start to feel that it's reasonable for things to be difficult and it's reasonable for things to require work. Things don't just naturally happen. You've got to work for them. So by showing them the side of things, I think it can definitely help quite a lot. But learning Polish also means that you're learning where your students' mistakes come from. A lot of mistakes are L1 translation. We talked about this in a session back in Krakow, I'm sure. Uh, but if you know a bit about L1 and a bit about Polish, if you've got word order problems, you know where it comes from. With young learners, how old are you? I have six. I have seven years old, something like this. You know where it comes from. It's the same as in French. They're using the verb to have to talk about their age, which is a translation mistake. And you can go straight in. You don't need to think, why is he saying have? That doesn't make sense. You don't have your age. And you say, oh, OK. So they say it in Polish that way. And then you can fix it. You know why the problem is there. And it's just a matter of replacing that Polish translation with the appropriate English. Doing that helps them feel closer to the language and gives them an attainable uh, task or a, a target that they can both aim for and succeed in achieving. And then finally, and this is less of a kind of in-classroom thing, I suppose, but you need to choose your battles, frankly. Not every issue can be solved. Most issues can't be solved there and then. So you need to communicate with your school when you have consistent problems. 
And sometimes you need to know when to let it go. So I started this session with the example from the school, the message in the chat saying one of the students is sitting under the table. And my reply was, well, if they're quiet, leave them. Because if you pull a student out from under a table, you're going to exacerbate the issue. They'll start crying. They'll start screaming. Other students will start to get scared because what's the teacher doing? They're manhandling a child. It's best sometimes just to say, ah, oh, never mind, and teach the students that you can teach. If the problem recurs, then you would speak to your school and see what structures are in place uh, to fix those sort of problems. And there will be structures. You will have uh, a chain of communication. You report the problem. The problem is written down. The parents might be contacted. If it, gets, if it goes further, then the parents might come in for a, a meeting with you or with the school to discuss the issue. There have been cases in my time at my school where after trying to resolve um, issues in the classroom, eventually it was decided that the student was just going to be removed from the class because they were too disruptive. Now that of course is the luxury that a private language school can offer. Uh, in state schools, that's not really such an option and we have to try and fix as many problems as we can, but you're not alone. There is a whole school around you. There are other teachers, there are systems in place and it's good to know what they are and how they can work for you. Okay. Oh, that come on step by step. That's boring. Spin it again. Step by step is boring. Spin it again. If you want to get rid of any of the things that you've discussed, you can always click eliminate once right. it comes up as the option. Oh, mm -hmm. see, this is why it's why we have Chris. It's why we like yeah. Chris. Uh, eliminate is probably not the best word for it because it sounds so kind of bloodthirsty, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, learn their L1. Mm. Holy moly. So I think uh, we'll start with Mark Alicious. Mark Alicious, start us off. Yo, um, I'm still trying to even learn the very much the basics, really. I don't know. It's, uh, okay. it's a bit tough in the class. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes, like, I've had it that uh, in the lesson, if I'm trying to explain something. So, I, 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 like, in my classes, it depends, really. Sometimes I have, like, quite strong students. And the other ones aren't so as as on the on the level. Um, so I have uh, some kids. If they, if I'm explaining, they understand me. Then they will like in Polish tell the, the other kids. You know, um, explain it a little bit better than than they understand. But then I'll go back and then just reiterate what I was saying. Um, you know, like do you understand now that the, your students have explained to you? This is it that we need to do, and this is the word. This is the word you might have been struggling with. Um, and then sometimes they will come and tell me, and they will say like. Like I was yesterday, I was getting them help, to help me uh, take off all the posters because we had Erasmus Day. So I had to like decorate the classroom with all like Irish pictures and stuff. And um, I was trying to say to them like, collect the press stick. I need the press stick. And they were like, like looking at me, I'm like, this sticky press stuff. And they, were, they told me it's um, blue tuck or blue mm -hmm. tick or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, was like, I was like, okay, blue tuck, blue tuck. And then it was a big joke because now I can't pronounce it properly. Then everyone's kind to be like, no, blue and I'm like, but I'm going blue. Tuck. Like, what's wrong with you? And they're like, no, 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 it's not like that. So I'm like, so how is it? So, it, but that's it that's cool. nice because that kind of builds rapport a little bit, doesn't it? It kind of brings yeah. you closer to the students. And when yes. you're closer to the students, they might start feeling bad when they play up because it hurts that relationship. Correct, but yeah. I mean, with learning there are one. Yes, Polish is a very difficult language. However, even from a very kind of broad overview of the language you very quickly learn that they don't have auxiliary verbs they don't have operators in a sentence so uh, to make a question in polish you use inflection or chi if it's going to be a binary yes no question so when your students start using inflection or sentence structure like statement structures to make a question you know why they're making that mistake they haven't got the idea yet of operators so that's where they need that help. Um, it, it's, it's something that plagues students all the way up to C2 level with, with you know, university students. They still make questions as if they were statements. Knowing a bit of Polish can kind of help you understand why and then to treat the problem. Okay. I find, I find Learn There L1, it's interesting that this is here actually because uh, I, I'm teaching a class that I'm just not qualified for basically. Um, they are 
uh, very young. Their English isn't very good. Um, you know, all my training was in business English. So like, you know, yeah. you know, gone. Um, but what, you know, thinking on the spot, when I spoke to the teacher, so they have a Polish teacher uh, and me as a native language teacher, um, the, uh, <laughs> the Polish teachers just like, just do anything with them. Like what? Is there nothing like, you know, is there nothing specifically that maybe you've been working on in the past week uh, that I can expand on? Um, and she's like, nah. So I was like, oh, brilliant. Okay, cool. So what the fuck am I going to do? Um, so I, I just make We'll bleep that out when we put this on YouTube. Oh, this is on YouTube. Oh, it sorry, will be. Chris. I, 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 came as, I, I came as like a last minute kind of um, thing. I was like, oh, I'll join, see how everyone's doing. Um, Miles hopped in the breakout room and said, it's Saturday. I can say whatever I want. <laughs> That's true, actually. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's technically an off day. No, but with, with this class. So like, for example, um, I was just thrust into this class. I didn't know I was teaching them. I, I was not even told. And I was a bit like, oh, OK, um, that's that's fine. That's been that's happened before. Um, but with these students, their level of English, because I'm not used to it. Um, I, I said I, I started off by doing the whole like, so today we are going to build a house. And then, like, you know, very slowly, because some of the students I could guess knew what I meant. Some didn't. Uh, but I didn't know their level of English at all. So I was just going on a whim. Uh, and I was like, and in this house we can have anything we want and the kids were like oh. and I was like we could have a swimming pool full of chocolate and they were like oh. and I was like we can have a room of Haribo and like small things like that but so back to this learn their L1 thing I know like, I only know how to order coffee or beer. That's it. You know, I can't even order water. No, okay, bother. I know. Um, Sorry, but um, my point being is that during this, um, because I asked them to draw the house, um, they were pointing at things, uh, not using English, but using Polish. Uh, and it was a great way for me to A, test their knowledge on English already, uh, but B, uh, get them to use their L1 with the physical representation of a drawing. Uh, so I could then chime in uh, and then sort of, you know, repeat after them. Uh, don't get me wrong. This example I'm giving, um, you know, I'm a bit intimidated. I have Chris, who's like, you know, apparently a messiah, like, you know, in, in, in the English world, he's really good. Uh, but That's only my... from the beard, you see. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It, you're also quite funny, Chris. So, you know, I've got, I got a lot of time for you. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Miles. <laughs> but like... Um, <laughs> Like in, in terms of like uh, thinking on my feet and like last minute, um, really out of my depth because I, like I said, I'm not trained in it. It was happened last minute. Uh, I got them to use their L1 with the physical representation of a drawing. Uh, so at least then I could chime in with some English. Yeah. Um, but if you think about the different things we've discussed, that chimes in very well with this sense of ownership that you can give to the students. So you probably found that mm. you didn't have so many classroom management issues then no. because they no. owned the task. It was theirs to give. Mm. And of course, okay, that's all in Polish. So the language is attainable. The question for us is how can we replicate that sense of ownership while still keeping it on the English? Uh, there are ways of doing it and it soon becomes apparent, but it helps so much, doesn't it? If the students feel that it's their lesson and not yours that you're Im imposing on them, um, a lot of the problems kind of disappear. So thank you for the example. Yeah, no. The... Yeah. I use it to get ideas really more than follow its process exactly. But like, I'll be like, oh, you know, like it, it usually gives me a, like play this song and then do this and then do this. So I'll take things and I'll be like, okay, you know, and I'll be like, my kids wouldn't enjoy this. So we're not going to do that part. Or like, you know, I adjust it for my classroom, but I find it really, really helpful to just, you know, look at the steps in the book and adjust them as needed. Yeah. And sometimes in the teacher's book, there are some great ideas for cool games or. Yeah, exactly. Uh or like some. <laughs> <laughs>
It's not, not actually me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Too much pressure. <laughs> yeah. Up and down, uh, move and settle. Like, I've found this so important with the younger groups. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like maintaining that uh, that um, focus. Oh. If, they, if they sit for too long, they get bored. If they move for too long, like they just, you can't control them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like it's, um, you need a dam for to hold the waters back, but you also need to have the river for the water to flow into. So it's kind of a combination of both, isn't it? Absolutely. So, I mean, some of the little things that you can do would be if, if you can see that they're getting restless after some drilling, then maybe it's switch the coral really drilling good. to being a march. Okay, stand up, follow me. And then you're like, red, <laughs> red, 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 green, green. And you're marching around the room. There's no reason to be marching except to help burn off some of that energy for them, yeah. get them moving. And they, for some reason, they feel like it's fun. I would yeah. hate it if in an adult classroom, somebody wanted me to do that. I'd be like, you're joking, aren't you? We're <laughs> sitting down now and I'm staying here until the end of this lesson. Yeah. But the kids, you know, they see things very differently. Yeah. And somehow like their, their brain is connected to their feet. Yes, that's exactly right. I'm like, oh, he wants to talk, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's and and also, um, so we we have some, um, uh, I don't know, we, we try a bit of English Polish together, um, but we found that both of us can speak a little bit of French. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of do it in a little bit of French style as well. But anyway um okay we have one more minute by the way okay let's do am i on eliminate mm -hmm. yeah okay okay can i spin okay, yeah <laughs> what did it what's it saying you can eliminate yeah. it then. We were now talking about this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we eliminate it then if you've discussed it enough. Go for a different one. Okay. Um, uh, um, yeah, so Chris, my, my screen is going on and off, so I can't really see what's happening. So <laughs> the, um, the girl for helping me navigate. <laughs> All right, so there we go. So up and down, move and settle. Um, okay. <laughs> so it's important to alternate between movement types. Mm -hmm. um, I guess to keep it fresh and to keep their focus. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also, to help them burn off excess energy. Yes. As Chris was saying before, they are very the younger ones are very energized. And I see that with my kindergartens, like they have all this energy. But don't sit with them and just talk. No, they want to do something. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's also uh, connected with this. It's also good to not come down on students for fidgeting. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, yeah. children yeah. fidget, and I've seen teachers who try to stop them fidgeting, and they make it an issue in the classroom. But the children aren't even conscious of it. Uh -huh. They're kind of adjusting how they sit. They're on I think the mat that's on the with floor. one of my students. Yeah, <laughs> it's like natural. This, it's yeah. It's one of the biggest ways in which children burn calories is through fidgeting. They, they burn hundreds of calories a day just by kind of fidgeting as they're sitting and uh, sitting down. It's completely natural and subconscious and it, we shouldn't draw attention to it. We shouldn't criticize those who do it because it's not fair. Um, but you're right. Yeah. Movement is, is essential, but they need to have those times to settle. Mm. so that they are aware that this is the lesson that yeah. sometimes the teacher wants you to sit down and focus on a piece of paper and do a task so um i don't use google as such very much instead i use scholar.google. well pl because i'm in poland uh, but if you do a search for example efl young learners classroom management you will find a huge variety of different 
academic articles. I prefer academic to popular articles because popular articles in a lot of kind of teaching magazines and things like that or blog posts, they don't go to enough depth for really what's there. So mm -hmm. I quite like this approach. And a lot of what we've looked at today was drawn from um, some of these yeah, documents. You can. <laughs> you can kind of tell that they're not all my ideas. You can see the purple where I've got like PDFs that I've downloaded. It's amazing <laughs> just how much is out there. I did a lot of reading for this session, I have to admit, mm -hmm. but it was, it was useful for me because there were a few things that I hadn't thought of, many things I hadn't thought of. Um, but yeah, like you've got this paper by Zyn, Classroom Management for Teaching English to Young Learners from a whole handbook of teaching. You can click there mm. and get the PDF for free. So this session then is like the first step for you in refreshing your, your systems of thinking of, of, about classroom management. The next step is for you to take, and that's to do as much reading as you can and to also communicate your findings to each other. Um, we should all keep in touch as much as possible. And if you find something really interesting, send it out there, post it on Facebook, tag people in it, tag me. Mm -hmm. I don't mind. If you have a question, write it in your status on Facebook and tag me in it so that I can then be like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Miles, any ideas? <laughs> and there we I go. Know, I, I was going to say, like, I just, I wasn't too sure if it was a T-shirt underneath or a tattoo, but it's a T-shirt. Sorry. Sorry. That's what you've been thinking about. You've been looking down my no. shirt instead of... <laughs> some people think that's a compliment, Chris. Some, <laughs> some, some might. Others, and on might that... others might think it's a little bit creepy. <laughs> and on that entirely wholesome and... Uh... Can, I, can I make a new adjective? Can I say millennial? Millennial? Like that. There we go. Like Miles' that. comment is a millennial comment. A millennial comment. On that millennial point, I think we'll call it uh, a day. Thank you all very much for coming to the session. And I hope to see you again on the 30th, same link as before, I think, where we'll be looking at developing young learners' writing skills. So I'll be doing another Google Scholar search later today. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Chris. Thank Thanks, you Chris. very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Best of luck in the best Thank of luck you. in the week to come. Enjoy. Bye. 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 Bye.